Welcome everyone, Questini here with a discussion about the least fun races to play in Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires. Now, quite a few people are going to say, oh, this is just a sub subjective opinion of mine. But these races come up again and again and again in the comment section. Quite a lot of people, outright majorities of the player base, do feel like this. In some cases, the vast majority of the player base, like 80-90% of the player base, would agree with the sentiment. So, when you have a situation like that, there is a problem, a major one. Now, to begin with, I want to talk about the worst race overall in the, ga uh, the game, like just badly designed, least fun to play in. That is, of course, the Demons of Chaos. When I say demons, however, I'm not just talking about poor Yuri, Daniel, the Demon Prince. I'm talking about every single demonic faction. Now, don't get me wrong, you can certainly enjoy Nakari's campaign, you can certainly enjoy Scarbrand's campaign if you are into playing a lot of balance manually, but overall, when you're looking at the demonic race as a whole and the sub-factions, be it Sinch, Slanesh, uh, Tsin, Slanesh, Nurgle, Korn, or Undivided, they are just pretty horrible. Warriors of Chaos are much better to play, better designed, and just have a better campaign experience. I think the Demons of Chaos represent, in a lot of ways, how badly the races, the baseline races of Warhammer Free Realms of Chaos were designed. In the sense that they were certainly designed for a far more limited campaign. And to be clear, they weren't even that great in that campaign either. There's races in Realms of Chaos that are actually better, like Cafe is a lot better than every other baseline race of Realms of Chaos. And now you have the Chaos Orbs and you have the Warriors of Chaos, or rather the Champions of Chaos. They are significantly better to play and a lot more fun to play. So yeah, the demonic races, the demonic race as a whole is just very limited. There's a couple of problems, several issues. One, the Ant Resolve uh, is not great for any of them. Demonic units don't do very well in Ant Resolve because a lot of them, including Korn, for demons themselves, just have poor armor and not necessarily the highest leadership in the game as you might imagine. As a result of that, you might have to fight a lot of battles manually. Furthermore, the unit roster for demons, all of them, is not really that great. I mean, you look at the demonic factions right now, you look at Nakari, you look at Scarbrand, you know what the best units for Nakari and Scarbrand are? It's not the bloody demon units, though some of them can help right, as support units, right, you can use blood letters to support your warriors of chaos, you can use the flanker units for a Nakari to win field battles and even sieges, but really the mainline units you want to use even in those campaigns which can work are the warrior units, and that's because warriors and demons were tied together before, and even when we look at the end times, like, Archeon wasn't just controlling an army of warriors of chaos, he was controlling an army of warriors and demons. So they're meant to complement each other. So having factions that are demonic in nature just doesn't work that well. These units are pretty damn expensive. Like, look at Blood Letters, 200 upkeep by the uh, default. Demon it's 200. Nurglings are cheaper, sure. Blue Horror is 125 for a really shit unit that is vastly inferior than other units that are much, much cheaper. Just to understand how bad blue horrors are, a unit of goblin archers, which is cheaper to recruit and much cheaper to maintain, will win in a 1v1 fight. And I don't know, there's just something wrong about having demons losing to trash. I mean, I can take a bunch of greenskin units and demolish a bloodletter army because, yeah, bloodletters might win in melee, they'll lose in range. So there's something fundamentally broken about the way the de demonic race is uh, is made. And you're going to have a much better experience, a much more interesting experience, if you're playing the Warriors of Chaos. Not that Warriors of Chaos are great, but demons are far, far worse. In fact, demons are so bad that they don't even deserve a spot on this list. Like, they're, they're worth throwing in the garbage. So it's good that Creative Assembly has decided to finally rework and prove them. Their economy is very limited. They uh, they have issues on auto resolve. They have issues with their unit roster. They even have issues with replenishment, unless you're talking, of course, about uh, Kugaf. Yes, Scarbrand actually has issues with replenishment on his blood toast, right? Because they can't replenish. So all of them have severe issues and limitations because they were designed for a more limited campaign. And they weren't even that great for that limited campaign to begin with. 
And number five, we have The Vampire Coast. Now, what makes The Vampire Coast so horrible to play? What reduces the fun factor? Well, the fact that pretty much their entire army roster, if we're discounting artillery, is just really worthless. Like, they have one of the worst army rosters in the entire game. Ignore the fact that I can get man-eaters over here for a poor, that's because I'm a mod. But let's look at the Vampire Coast roster. Most of their units, vast majority of their units, with the exception of Death Guard and to an, uh, to an extent the Necrofax Colossi, but a lot of their units are either really expensive, like the Rotting Leviathans, or they're cheap, they're not necessarily the cheapest units either, like you consider the fact that a gunnery mob is 138 upkeep, but they're cheap, and yet they have very low armor, if any armor at all, and they have extremely poor leadership. Now, this is actually a major issue. Skaven can have poor leadership, but Skaven can get away with it because while Skaven may have poor leadership, you can always rally and bell. If you lose the leadership on a zombie unit, on an undead unit, it's going to start crumbling, so you might lose your army again and again and again. And while you can certainly recover it, losing all that experience is a major problem for the Vampire Coast. So your army is bad, it's especially bad in sieges, and there's a lot of sieges in any single campaign. Basically, if you're playing a Vampire Coast campaign, with the exception of RNS, you gotta get used to the fact that your army is practically worthless. It's not gonna do very well in field battles necessarily, it's not gonna do well in sieges. The way you make it work is you focus on getting a lot of artillery units and maybe you get a couple of the better units that might take some damage like Depth Guard, for instance, or Depth Guard with Pole Arms or Necrofix Colossi. And again, those are not top tier units in themselves and they're also pretty expensive. Another big issue that really reduces the fun factor for the Vampire Coast is how their hero capacity works. Yes, you can increase Vampire Fleet Captain or rather, you can uh, you you can increase vampire fleet captain for a tier five port, not tier three, tier five. That is one of the worst ways to increase hero capacity of any campaign in the entire game. And having fewer f heroes is not a fun experience. Now you can, of course, uh, you can es establish pyrocoves in settlements that have ports in them. But the problem is you can only establish those coves in settlements you don't control. So what you do is you go up to a settlement, you fight the, the garrison, you might have to fight a lot of manual battles in a campaign, which in itself reduces the fun factor in any campaign. So they have one of the worst thoughts resolve situations in the game. They have one of the worst armies in the game as well. And you can't even take settlements because in order to increase the hero capacity, you need to set up those pirate coves. The fact you can't do it for proper settlements is awful. And if you think leaving settlements under AI control under the hopes that another AI faction that you might be allied with can take them over and actually use them, well, that's a pretty bad campaign plan. Now, people will argue that you don't need to hold land territory in most of our campaigns. Lufer Harkon is the major exception of this. And while that is true, giving the AI that kind of power where you're not fighting against the fourth territory, where you're not seizing territory, does have significant drawbacks in any campaign. Because you're basically uh, letting the AI decide the course of those campaigns. You can win an entire campaign as, as the Vampire Coast, I certainly did so. In fact, the first campaign I ever finished of Immortal Empires completely, as in actually achieved um, the long campaign victory condition and dealt with the ending a crisis was as a Vampire Coast, but I, would, I virtually fought like 90% of the battles on my, uh, on my own uh, manually. It is not a fun army, it is not a good faction, the campaign mechanics are bad, the army is bad, there's nothing really that great about the Vampire Coast with the exception of the artillery. Yes, zombie artillery can be fun, don't get me wrong, and their lords and heroes can be strong, but you're just, you've got so many limitations in the campaign that it makes the experience pretty awful to deal with. And number four is the Warriors of Chaos. I, I gotta love how Archeon's portrait over here is bugged out as he gives his intro speech. But what's wrong about the Warriors of Chaos? They're not a weak race. In fact, they're probably one of the strongest, if not the strongest, in the entire game. If you're playing a Warriors of Chaos campaign, you would struggle really, really hard to lose that campaign 
in its entirety. That's because, well, Dark Fortresses are just impregnable, as impregnable as any settlement can get in the game. They have pretty good garrisons, and the layout of the Dark Fortresses themselves make it an absolute nightmare to actually assault, even if you know what you're doing. Suffice it to say, the AI doesn't know what it's doing, and on top of that, a lot of Dark Fortresses are in territory where the attacker might actually take a lot of attrition, even for the AI with all of its attrition benefits, just getting to the settlement. And then there's the vassal mechanic where you have vassals as every single legendary lord of the Warriors of Cast. In fact, you can get some extremely powerful vassals. So you're in a position where you can take other powerful legendary lords, like, say, for instance, the Dark Elves, as just an example, and vassalize them and have them run the campaign for you. And you're not going to lose because you're, you're only holding on to key settlements like the Dark Fortresses. You're giving everything else to your vassal. So if they lose it, so what? They might take it back themselves anyway. And the AI taking those settlements is going to bleed them dry in the attacker. And you can always turn an opponent or a lot of opponents into your vassals. Now, that's a lot of power, right? Between the strategic settlements, which are difficult to take, the power that they have for their army, the power they have for the upgrade system, the gifts of chaos, research, you name it, warriors of chaos are extremely powerful. And the remake certainly made them a lot better than they were before. However, this is an example where you have a really powerful race with pretty good mechanics that is boring as dirt to play. The reason it's boring as dirt is winning a campaign from turn one is not a fun experience. I've played a decent number of Warriors of Chaos campaigns and every single one of them turned into the same damn thing. Like I might have some challenge in some of them, depend on the starting position, not as Arcan to be damn certain, but I might have a challenge in some of those campaigns, but then eventually I just steamroll and I can't lose, regardless of how hard I try. You would have to try really, really hard to lose a campaign as the Warriors of Chaos in a very, uh, to, to lose an entire campaign, to be completely wiped out. And that is not a fun experience. At least you're conquering territory and vassalizing factions, but dealing with the vassal system is also not necessarily a fun experience either because, well, Dealing with a bunch with dozens of different AI factions as your allies, uh, as your vassals, it just is can be a pretty awful experience if you actually want them to achieve something. And they can achieve a lot if you play it properly. Like if you vassalize Grimgor, watch him turn burn the world uh, uh, all around him. In fact, you vassalizing Grumgor might actually make Grumgor a lot more powerful because it focuses him. Because he's only gonna, because obviously he's only gonna be at war with your opponent. So instead of him randomly declaring war on various factions, you get to decide who he's gonna declare war on, and that's a ridiculous amount of power. But it's powerful, and yet really, really dull to deal with. And number three, we have the Wood Elves. Now, the Wood Elves are very similar to the Warriors of Chaos in that they have a good amount of power, they have the economic potential, they have a lot of diplomatic potential, funnily enough, which kind of goes against the lore because they're supposed to be isolationists, but they have a lot of diplomatic potentials in, uh, potential in their campaign because people don't really hate the Wood Elves all that much, um, unless they're, you know, a, fa a faction like Chaos or Beastmen, but most factions don't really despise the Wood Elves and you have a lot of diplomatic potential because you don't really need to hold territory in your campaign except the big trees. So you can trade a lot of the territory for diplomatic dealings, which gives you a significant amount of power uh, from a diplomatic point of view in every campaign you're playing as the Wood Elves. But here's the issue, and it's a similar issue to the Warriors of Chaos. You are a steamroller faction. From turn one and every single Wood Elven campaign, or Orion being the least like this, but from turn one and every Wood Elven campaign, you will just steamroll your opponents without a care in the world. You can't lose because your big trees have pretty damn powerful garrisons, uh, even looking at tier one. Like, you want to attack a settlement that has this kind of army in it? Yeah, that, that would be pretty substantial. Now, the defenses are not as bad as a Dark Fortress, and you... Uh, and you don't necessarily have the same kind of impact as cast corruption until you start talking about Alpha Lauren. And then you do. And Alpha Lauren, you know what? Alpha Lauren is a really unpleasant place to conquer in a campaign map because you have all these trees right next to each other. Good luck to anyone trying to attack and, and conquer Alpha Lauren is pure misery. 
in any campaign. In fact, it, the the way Athelorn is designed is, is in such a way that it actually makes it awful for anyone that might be hostile to the Wood Elves to start next to them. Because if you're start, if you're picking a fight with one of the factions there, you're picking a fight with all of them. That's what's going to happen. So the Wood Elves also can't lose a campaign. The reason I'd say... The reason I'd say is worse. Yeah, Aphelorin does contribute a lot to it. And on top of that, you have the situation where if you're playing a Wood Elf campaign, you can teleport around the world using Deep Roots. Sounds fun until you realize just how much nonsense there is available through this. See, I'll show you why. There is a research over here, right? The Wisdom of the Eagle Lords. Now, this gives you line of sight to all the magical forests. Now, the amount of nonsense you can get up to diplomatically with this is absurd to an insane uh, to an insane level. Like, for instance, over here, I can go to Talson and just declare war on Paravan. I don't want to do it because I obviously don't want to suffer from that, but I can do it. And when you get sight on all of the forests around the world you can just declare war on half the planet with no consequences whatsoever because what are what are the AI factions going to do invade you across that half the world to attack you yeah that's obviously not going to be a workable solution so you don't have an economic issue you can support very large armies and every single one of those armies is incredibly powerful yes it's not as broken not as powerful the armies aren't necessarily as powerful as the warriors of chaos they're against uh, at least some of them but though you can absolutely make them once you get treekin or if you're playing draka malevolent treekin so the campaigns can be fun to some extent sure but it's like it gets really tiring very very quickly like all the wood elves ultimately will end up basically playing a version of Orion's campaign where you just maintain very large armies because of all the cash you're getting in and no one's ever going to challenge you. No one's really going to attack your territory. Actually, I can't think of the last time when I played the Wood Elf campaign where anyone even really had a chance to take one of my uh, trees in my campaign. But I would certainly say like the Wood Elves and the Warriors of Kais are very, very similar in the way they are. They're both powerful races. They both steamroll the map, and that makes them pretty boring to play. I mean, it's fun a couple of times, don't get me wrong. Like, having a flying artillery piece or flying artillery pieces with the Sisters of Twilight and the Hawk Riders or the monsters of the forest with Durfu and Draiga, that's fun. Uh, to an extent, but then it just loses its luster, and you'd never want to play a Wood Elf campaign again. In terms of the least fun races to play, we, of course, have the Empire. What is there to say about the Empire that hasn't been said a hundred times already? I'll just give you an example. In the lore, Halberdiers are one of the main units that the Empire actually uses. In the game, the Halberdiers are a worthless unit to use in a campaign. They're just not worth it. They're not shielded units. They have low armor. They're not going to stand up in a fight. They'll take a lot of damage and not resolve. They'll take a lot of damage in battles. There are much better units to actually use in an Imperial campaign like Spearmen with Shields or Greatswords. But here's where the Empire is not fun to play and just really broken as a race. Every single Imperial campaign, be it Karl Franz, Balthazar Geld, Volkmar, or the Hunts Marshal, have pretty busted mechanics. For Volkmar, the books of Nagash are not great. For the Hunts Marshal, his hostility meter is awful. And for Karl Franz and Balthazar Geld, the Imperial Authority system just sucks as do does the empire i'll just give you an idea how the weak the empire is if you're playing virtually any other race in the game and you can take over the empire take over the empire why because the empire is easy to take down that's the thing the unit roster early game and this is a major problem the unit roster early game is not great yes once you get and for whatever reason the game is bugged and showing i can recruit dark shards but once you get to a point where we can recruit great swords and huntsmen and then get artillery and demigriffs yes it can work out but there are races that have much better unit rosters earlier on in a campaign you want to compare great swords and huntsmen to trigan that's just a tier three option or tier two depending on who you're talking about you want to compare them to the high elven spearmen um uh, spearmen archer meta you want to talk about dark shards or Black Ark Corsairs, and those are just a couple of examples, or Nasty Skulkers and Goblin Archers. Yeah, a lot of races have better rosters. What that means is 
it's not fun playing an Imperial campaign because your army is just substantially weaker than what other people have to offer. Now, people would say, well, the Imperial armies are cheap to recruit. Yes, but they're not necessarily so cheap to maintain, and that's the issue. Because while you can certainly get a lot of units, and just keep in mind, one of the best early game units you have are the Bloody Archers, which are a DLC unit that is that is tier 1 unit, and it's weaker than archers that the high elves can get, and it's far weaker than goblin archers as well. Actually, they're kind of on the same level with goblin archers, and they're worse than goblin archers. So you have a lot of problems in the unit roster, which makes your early game complete misery. And having a good early game experience is so instrumental, I'd argue, in Warhammer 3 in terms of having a good, fun campaign. I'm not saying the early game roster should be the most overpowered in the world. I'm saying it should be functional. Like, consider the Chaos Dwarves, right, which are a really fun race to play. Their base units are not their tier 1 units. Their Hobgoblins are just early game trash units. But they function pretty well in their role. The Imperial roster, a lot of it could be thrown in the trash. They have a decent economy, growth, control, etc., but it's just that decent. Their heroes, lords, and lords do leave a lot to be desired in terms of their power. And as I mentioned, their campaign mechanics just do suck a lot. And if you endure all of that, yes, you might get to a decent mid or late game if you're willing to go through all of that misery, but it is an awful experience. Like, just look at... Uh, Carl Franz's campaign. Do you know what the best thing I can do in a Carl Franz campaign is not fight to defend the Empire, not, don't engage in any of that, just basically declare a war unknown, wipe out their army, then take um, then take Wizenberg and sell it to Gelt or Averheim again and again and get the event to get an unlimited number of Imperial authority. I think the problem with the Empire is that they never went through a rework like the other races did. I mean, Vampire Counts also never went for a rework, but Vampire Counts are a very relevant race to this day. The Empire is not. And the Empire really needs some love. Thankfully, we're gonna get a DLC to rework them. Though, it's probably gonna take half a year to do so. It is certainly gonna take half a year until we get that DLC, because they said winter this year. So, hey, we hope that Creative Assembly will do a good job, but let's see what comes out of that. Now, at number one, and far and above everyone else, we of course have the Ogre Kingdoms. Now, the Ogre Kingdoms got over 50% of the votes in the poll, and I'd argue for good reason. I'd say they're the worst faction to play in terms of fun factor in the game right now, besides the Demons of Chaos, or Demons in general. What are the problems with the Ogres? Well, their early game roster is terrible, and having a weak early game roster it just reduces the fun factor by quite a lot. The problem with the Ogre Bulls and the variants of Ogre Bulls, yeah, that's a really fun and exciting unit roster that you're going to use for a lot of your early game campaign. It's like just Ogre Bulls and variants of them and Noblars and Noblar Trappers. That's genuinely one of the worst unit rosters you can have in a campaign early on. And, it's, and while it can get better, you're not necessarily going to afford a lot of the better units in a campaign. Keep in mind, this campaign that I'm showing you right here is probably one of the best case scenarios you can actually have playing as Greases. The reason it's one of the best case scenarios is because I've avoided up until this point wars with Cafe, Grimgore, and I actually have a defensive alliance with Gore. So Emmerich is going to be a problem. And the thing is, there's many other races in the game that are have much better early game rosters, much better campaign mechanics and are a lot more fun to play and aren't as limited as the ogres. The problem with the ogres is that while they have potential in terms of their late game roster, you're gonna need to get ogre camps to even unlock that late game roster to get like things like lead belchers or Mornfat cavalry or man eaters. Imagine if we could actually enjoy those things in an ogre campaign, but we really cannot unfortunately because of the way they are designed. They're a very, very limited race. Their regular settlements only go up to tier 3, and the income they generate is pretty pathetic. Like, it starts at 50, it goes to 150, and while camps can buff that income up to 12% at the tier 5 camp, it is still going to be incredibly limited. You need, like, 10 ogre camps at a reasonably high level to even get this income uh, to even get this tier 1 income to 100, and 
most other races, every other race starts at least 100. 100 in general is one of the worst incomes you can ha have, unless we're talking about races with special mechanics like Corn or Skaven or something like that. And just to be clear, Scarbrand can generate a lot more money than this in this campaign, and Skaven can generate can have one of the best economies in the game, even if they do have quite a few limitations. So there's a lot of issues with the limitations on settlements, because as with other races here, they were designed for a more limited campaign. Now, what about the camps? Well, the camps, you might think they're great, but look at this camp. This is the first camp I built, and I'm on my way to getting it to tier 4, though it's still going to take me at least four more turns to be able to start building it to tier 4, and then five, five turns to do so. And it's only at that point that I can actually get a fire belly and I can even afford the growth to get uh, to get a butcher because you're going to need the surplus points also to build construct other structures like the, the camp growth one, the local recruitment capacity and income structure, other things as well. Like, like, look at this camp. The only things I've built, like the only like a luxury, if you if you will, is that I've gotten myself lead belchers and uh, scrap launchers over here, which I'm looking to recruit. And great scenario over here, being able to ally Gorst. Like, if you're playing Greece's campaign, by the way, get Shambletown very quickly and sell it to Gorst early on in this campaign, because that might get you a defensive alliance as it did for me over here. But even if you manage a campaign perfectly, as the ogres, you're just going to end up really frustrated by the camp system because camps can't be moved. And it's a really stupid idea to destroy a camp and build another one. Because if you're doing that, that's going to cost you a lot of money. The problem is ogres need meat for their army. And guess where the meat comes from? It ain't ballast. This is an I like the food mechanic of Skaven where you can maintain your empire by constantly fighting battles to get food no you need a camp if you're playing as the ogres because the battles themselves don't give you generally that much meat like it's it's a really bad situation where if you put an army next to a camp it you'll just have so much ridiculous amounts of meat but if you move it from a camp it will collapse i think camps should be like black arcs on land where you can move them and the camp leader should be a lord that actually has a skill line because the camp tyrant does not camps are also indefensible but they're the center of your empire they give you the hero capacity and the unit recruitment and they buff your economy by quite a substantial amount so without them you're kind of screwed in a lot of ways you could play a very defensive oriented campaign as the ogres and make it work but if you enjoy 60 plus turns of doing fuck all except just building up camps and playing defense and raiding cafe and caravans sure go for it I don't think that's a really fun experience, and I think the vast majority of the player base agrees on that sentiment. And keep in mind, this is as Greece as who actually gets an extra camp, because right now the only uh, camps I have are two for research. There's a reason why ogres want to play up, but played by the eye never amount to much in any single campaign. I mean, granted, Rhesus's star position and Scrag's star position both are pretty terrible for legendary lords in general, like even stronger legendary lords would struggle with that. I mean, it's no picnic if you're playing as Gorst, I can tell you that much for a fact, in his starting position. Um, but being a weak ledger and lord, like um, like Rhesus or Scrag, in positions where they're very vulnerable, very exposed to much more powerful ledger and lord, like Scrag starts close enough to Belagar and Alphalorin that, yeah, that's going to be an issue. Uh, Rhesus has Grimgor, Gorst, Kugaf, Drazif, Emric, and Xiao Ming. That is a pretty brutal starring position, to say the least. And every one of those legendary lords will have better armies, better economy, and can defeat you. Like, it's honestly a minor miracle that I've gotten so far in this campaign without actually ending up in a war with any of them, with the exception of Drazov, which I personally instigated. And I got really, really lucky with Drazov because he lost a lot of his armies fighting Tretch. I mean, when Tretch can put up a genuine fight to you, and he did in this campaign, that is not a great race. It's not a fun race, lots of limitations. And I want to emphasize, this is not about difficulty. It's not about difficulty in isolation either, because I have the Warriors of Chaos and Wood Elves on this list. They don't have difficult campaigns. It's just like, what's the fun factor, right? How frustrated are you going to be in a campaign? These campaigns are 
either limited in many ways or they're not limited, but they're so, such a steamroll that the fun factor just isn't there. Costine here signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications and stay tuned for more.